What's happening, everybody? I pray everybody's doing fine at home. Thank you for tuning in tonight or whenever you tune in at 3 a.m. or whatever time you can. We do welcome you here on our online service. Looking forward soon to also open up Wednesday nights. But until then, we said... And we felt like the Lord was leading us to have communion every Wednesday. So make sure you grab your communion elements. At the end of our Bible study, we will take communion. And then next Wednesday is our third Wednesday. We will have a time of directed prayer as we did last month. And and so, uh, you know, just a time of waiting on the Lord and having prayer. uh, And, you know, prayer is always important. And as believers, we know that we are praying people, and so just give you some other insights. Would you please turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. As the author of Kings writes, we know that he writes in a, uh, a quick timeline. He uh, covers years, and um, we know that... Um, as he is writing, he's, he's given us, you know, the, the years and the days and the things that have been taking place with, uh, with Solomon. We left off where the queen of um, Sheba had come to visit Solomon, and I believe she left better than the way she came. She left different than the way she came. As Jesus mentions her in the gospel, I believe she left as a believer in the true God. She did come, she sought, and what she was looking for was who was behind the wisdom that Solomon had, and it was the Lord. Well, time then takes place as the writer takes us to verse 14 of chapter 10, and he begins to show us now, as we could call this, I guess, the downfall the beginning of Solomon's downfall. I think we saw some elements of it as we've been studying in the earlier verses, but now we really come to um, a message that I've called the sin of accumulation. Father, we ask that you'd speak to us tonight. Uh, Have your way with this service, Lord. I pray for everyone that is looking in, that is watching online, And whatever tablet they have, whatever way they're looking, Lord, that you would speak to them. You would be present right there where they're at, in their living rooms, in their bedrooms. Lord, wherever you have them tonight, that you would be speaking to them going beyond my notes, God. Lord, we we have come together and gathered together, yes, for Bible study, but we've also asked that you would speak to us through these verses, God, for today. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Everybody at home said, amen. You know, God, if you think about God, he has his mathematics, doesn't he? I mean, he adds and he subtracts, he multiplies, and he divides. And friends, we need to allow God to do the math. We need to allow him to do the math to work out the equations in our lives. We get in trouble when we take control of the elements of God's arithmetic. As we will see here tonight, and hopefully you you were able to read ahead, uh, here in Solomon's latter half of his life, God made it clear when he first appeared to Solomon in a dream, telling him to ask what, what I can give to you. Ask what I shall give to you. And as he began his reign as king, we remember in 1 Kings 3, 11 through 14, that what did Solomon ask for? He was just a, a humble guy who had now great responsibility, a young man, and he just asked for wisdom. God, give me wisdom. And because of that, God said, you know what, Solomon, because you just asked for wisdom, and God knew his heart, I am going to bless you over and above anyone with, who had any kind of wisdom at that time, and plus, I'm going to bless you I'm going to bless you with anything that you would need. And so Solomon began his reign, you know, he began right. 
he, 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 he was very prosperous. He was very blessed as we've been studying. You see, Solomon will write about the importance of wisdom in many of his Proverbs and, and how this wisdom given to him by God is more profitable than silver and better than gold. In Ecclesiastes, he would write, and I saw that wisdom exceeds folly just as light exceeds darkness. But don't we wish that he would go back and, and read the words that he wrote? That, that he would go back and, and read the Proverbs that came from his heart, from his experience with God. As we know, he also writes and, about life when he's in these, these periods that we'll talk about here. And really in a backslidden state and how he saw life and how life was. And that was from someone who was not walking right with God. I, I believe personally he got his life squared away toward the end. And, but he didn't have to even go that path. We get so caught up with ourselves, don't we? But for Solomon, as I said, it was one thing in writing. And it was another thing in living it. Like so many people, even today, Solomon started out humble, following God. But sadly, it seemed the riches, the fame turned his heart to live in the opposite of what he knew to be right. God was becoming, uh, you know, less and less uh, in his life. And, and, and yet the riches were becoming more and more as he started to accumulate. And he didn't need to accumulate, as we'll read tonight. He didn't need to. God, I, I'm going to bless you with what you need, Solomon. But it seems like that he just began to go away in, in, in a different direction with it. So let's pick it up in, in verse 14. It says there, uh, chapter 10, 1 Kings, then the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. Notice that. Solomon's annual salary was 666. Does that mean anything? Take it if you want. 666 talents of gold. That was 25 tons of gold. That was his salary per se. Not counting all the other little gifts that he was given. 15 says, and uh, besides that from the traveling merchants from the income of traders, from all the kings of Arabia, and from the governors of the country. Besides all of that, Solomon accumulated much wealth. There were many people who were just blessing Solomon and giving him money. The sad thing is he became to be known as one who loved gold. Hey, we're going to uh, Israel. Hey, take gold with you. Solomon loves gold. Gift him with gold. You know, wealth is one of the things turning Solomon's heart from God. I believe Peter, excuse me, uh, Paul would write to Timothy to talk about money, and he says that the love of money, may I say the love of gold, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And we're going to start seeing this root grow and grow and grow in Solomon's life. Money isn't the root of all kinds of evil, but the love of it, the lust of it, becomes this root of all kinds of evil. And we've seen it in our days as well. Well, moving on to the king's shields. Look at verse 16. And the king Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. He also made 300 shields of hammered gold. Three minus of gold went into each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. This cracks me up because remember in the introduction, Solomon would be blessed without ever seeing any kind of war. In Solomon's reign, there was no war. Uh, Israel was at peace. Uh, as J. Ferdinand McGee would say, Solomon was a soft guy. Uh, he went on to remember to call him a sissy. We won't call him that. But he was a guy that lived in the palace. He was raised in the palace. He was raised by David. And, uh, you know, and, but he, he never saw war. So what, what, what's he doing making shields? And these were full body shields. These weren't just the little ones. But for him, they were for decorations. 
Gold was too heavy to go to war with. You couldn't go to war with gold. It was so heavy, to, you know. And, and, and gold, the metal itself, is soft. So it's ineffective during battle. Guys, this was just for show. This was all just for them to be some kind of ornament that he can hang in his palace, hang in his house. That, as it says, the house of force of Lebanon, that was his house. So he could just uh, uh, use them as decorations. When in reality, when, when they would go to war, those shields were, were really your life protecting protection. They were your protective gear. And yet, again, him not knowing war and being blessed by not engaging in war, he uses these things as shields. It seems as he's bored. Now what am I going to do with all this gold? Well, let's make shields. Let's make body shields out of them. And we'll just hang them up, you know. Not only that, verse 18 speaks of this throne that he made. Notice with me. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory. That's expensive. And overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps, and, and the top of the throne was round at the back, and there were armrests on either side of the place of the seat, and two lions stood besides the armrests. Twelve lions stood there, one on each side of the six steps. Nothing this had nothing like this had scripture says has been made for any other kingdom. This was the throne that Solomon would sit to judge. But now with these additions, people would wonder at the throne rather than at the wisdom that Solomon had from God. They would wonder of the, of the, of the throne rather than, than God who had given to Solomon this wisdom. You see, it removed the awe of God to the wonderment of this throne and the sense of Solomon's accessibility and availability. Remember in the beginning, the humble king who was accessible and available to all who needed to speak to him? Remember the two gals with the baby? And how, how uh, one said it was hers and the other one said it was hers and how the wise king was able to take care of that situation? How he was accessible? Well, now he has this throne. The man is bored, but he doesn't realize that in this wonderful, beautiful, no doubt, uh, from the man's sight that this, this throne was just something that was just awesome. Well, it was taken away the simplicity of a leader for, their, for his people. It affected them. It affected his accessibility and availability. How can I go and speak to the king? Look at him. He's on that grand throne. I mean... I can't, I can't go to him. I, who am I to go to, to one who sits on such a royal, beautiful seat like that? You know, I thank God that you and I can go directly to the Savior. Amen? We can go boldly as his children without hindrance. We go and worship him. We go and praise him. He's our all. He, he, he's our Lord. Nothing keeps us from going to God and worshiping him and seeking his wisdom, his guidance, his direction. Hey, the curtain tore when he gave up his ghost and it gave us accessibility to God personally. But moving on, not only did he build his throne up, even his drinking uh, vessels were made of gold. All Solomon's drinking vessels, verse 21, were made of gold. And, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Not one was silver, for this was accounted as, listen, nothing in the days of Solomon. Hello. You know, he would hold his goblets of these gold. You know, why? Did he need these? And no doubt he probably saw from other kings in the, in the surrounding countries what they had, but he was not like them. He was a special man of the, set aside to do the work of God. And then the king's merchant ships 
Verse 22, for the king had merchant ships at sea with the fleet of Hiram. And once every three years, the merchant ships came bringing again gold and silver, apes. I guess he liked apes. And it says, and monkeys, but Scholar says that word actually means should be peacock. And then I, I, I was reading another scholar. He says it's baboons. Anyway, it's animals. He sought interest in animals. Remember when he began, he was a, a, you know, a zoologist, an arborist. Uh, he, 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 God just blessed him with, with a, a young man who had knowledge and was able to learn and be learned, a learned man. But notice, please notice with me again in verse 23. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Notice it doesn't say wisdom and riches now. But riches are listed before wisdom. Now is that an English translation? Is that something from the Hebrew that... The, the translator just made. I don't know, but I think it makes a point here, and it's a true point in Solomon's life. That now he is putting his riches before his wisdom. Solomon is becoming known as the model of wealth and majesty instead of the model or instead of the person that he began of humility and wisdom. You know, someone said, it's good to have the things that money can buy, Provided you don't lose the things money can't buy. And he's losing that. You can't buy godly wisdom. You can't buy for us our salvation. You can't buy a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's given free by grace for the asking. And yet Solomon is losing that. He's he's losing that spiritual edge we could say. We see here in verse 24 that, again, many would come to visit him. It says, now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. And I like what the writer wrote here. He says, which God had put in his heart. Each man brought his present articles of silver, gold, garments, armor, spices, horses, mules at a set rate year by year, accumulating, accumulating, hoarding, hoarding, more and more. They think they're, they're helping him, they're blessing him, they're, and really these things are taking his eyes off of God who put his wisdom in his heart. It's one thing when God makes a person wealthy from their given talent and wisdom, and he does that still today. But yet it's another thing to give away that, that wisdom, to help others, to give away the wealth and, and, and those who are in need, those who, who need good counsel, that we, we make ourselves available to those who are, who are in need. And it seems to me that Solomon is becoming bored again. Instead of using his wisdom and planning how he can invest what he has in blessing others, he's, he's accumulating as I said, he's, he's hoarding, and this is bringing really harm to him. He has these chariots. Look at verse 26. He says there that, and Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. When we spoke about those cities up north of Israel where Solomon built up, those were the the cities that he would put these chariots. He would also put uh, different treasures or or, uh, banks or different places where he could, um, you know, uh, have supplies and things, you know, out in those areas. And this is where he would post these chariots and these horsemen. I think it's interesting that David's, uh, King David, Solomon's father, wrote in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of our God. There lies Solomon's problem. He was forgetting the name of the Lord. 
He was forgetting the Lord in all his accumulation. He was forgetting the one who put him on that throne. The one who blessed him with much wisdom in his heart. The one who underwrote, if I can say, and I say it very uh, respectfully, underwrote his, his ministry, underwrote his leadership, his kingship. He's, he's forgetting that. That also happens in these days. Many people forget how they got to where they, they are. Not only with, by God's grace and mercy, but other people helping them. And they think they can do it now on their own. I got it now. Have a nice day. You know, kind of deal. But here he's forgetting the name of the Lord. Verse 27 says, The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. Imagine that. He had so much gold that silver was just considered a throwaway. And because he had so much gold that it drove the value of silver down. And it says he made cedar trees as abundant as sycamores, which are in the lowland. What's interesting is I, uh, as I, and as we read about Solomon's great wealth, looking ahead at 1 Kings 14, verse 25 and 26, it tells us that it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, which would be Solomon's successor, who is Solomon's son, that Shishak, <laughs> king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And notice verse 26, it says, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields. Those shields he put up, for, he took those away which Solomon had made. Everything Solomon accumulated was taken away not even his son could enjoy it. And that's what the enemy does. He comes to steal and rob. And here came this enemy. Here came this king of Egypt. And everything that Solomon looked at that gave him, I don't know, a sense of power, a, a sense of uh, luxury and, and, and you, know, um, you know, his... Uh, uh, having that, that sense of, of security, I guess, is the word I'm trying to look for. Was at all, when he died, he couldn't take it with him, could he? No, so he just left it. None of that he could take with him. He left it for his son, and even his son could not enjoy it. As I said, we know that when we die, we can't take with us anything. But we can bless others who are going, doing the Lord's work. We can, we can send things ahead, if you've heard preachers say that. We can, we can send the blessing ahead as we bless others here on earth. But we should be doing that. If God has blessed us with above and beyond a blessing, we should be blessing other people. Nothing wrong with taking care of our families, if we're married, our wives, our children, putting some in savings, that's wise. That's where wisdom is. But when we become to a place where it's just an overabundance, you know, look to where you can invest it to those who are doing the Lord's work, to missionaries, to those who, well, who are naked and hungry and are in prison. Those in need, which is really an investment of our good works. As I said, we're sending it ahead to be blessed before the Lord in honoring God. This reminds me really of the parable of the rich fool spoken by Jesus in Luke 12, 15 through 21. Uh, he said to them, if you have a Bible, you can quickly turn to it. If not, I'm going to read it. He says, Jesus said, you know, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Man, isn't that heavy? Let me say that again. One's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Verse 16 of Luke 12, he says, Then he spoke to them a parable, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. 
I'll begin to give away my grain to those who are poor. I'll, 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 no, that's not what he says. This is what he says. He says, well, I have no room to store my crops. I'll pull down my barns and build greater barns. And there I will store all my crops and all my goods, mine. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? And so is he who lays up treasure for himself. It is not rich, rich toward God. That's the blessing. That's the rich that you want, the richness toward God. I think that's an important parable to think about. Matthew 6 tells us, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in like this king of of Egypt, Shishak broke in and steal. But Jesus says, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. That's what what I've been speaking about. Where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so we see Solomon's heart changing and, and really becoming a disobedient servant of God. Not only that, but we look at verse 28, and it says there in verse 28, also Solomon had horses, notice this, imported from where? From Egypt. And Kiva, the king's merchants, brought them in Kiva at the current price. Now, he's used, anyway. Now, a chariot that was imported from Egypt cost 600 shekels of silver and a horse 150. And and through their agents, they exported them to all kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So, Here we see that not only did he import um, horses from Egypt, but he also sold horses to the enemy. He not only was involved in accumulating horses, but he was also involved in the business of selling them back. And no doubt he would get them wholesale and, of course, sell them back retail. How much more does he need? How much more money that he's in need, gold does he need? He's just caught up in all of this. And then he's selling horses to the enemy. You know, King David refused to trust in chariots, didn't he? And he refused to trust in horses. Because God commanded in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 17, 16, but he, speaking of the future king, shall not multiply horses for himself. Nor cause people to what? Return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Solomon now, he's, uh, he is just totally, totally disobeying very clear commands. Very clear scripture that has been written for the future king. There's been written for kings of Israel. Not only is he multiplying horses, but he's having people go back to Egypt. God says, don't have them go back. Why would you, why would you send people back that way again? Our people, Israel. Because God knows when you go to Egypt, they will see things that they shouldn't see. They will be involved in things they shouldn't be involved in. The temptation and the luring of what's in Egypt. We don't need to go back to Egypt. God says, and he's doing everything the opposite of what God has says not to do. That command, command found in Deuteronomy 17 also speaks of Solomon's next folly as we wrap this up tonight. Notice Deuteronomy 17, 17. It says, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. He violated those, both of those commands. Neither shall he multiply wise for himself, but look at chapter 11, verse 1, but King Solomon. 
It says love. I put here lusted. He lusted for many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. Remember back in the beginning? He, he allowed his heart to roam. The heart, which is a lonely hunter, he allowed it to be open to someone like this daughter of Pharaoh, an unbeliever. He was, you know, allowing his heart to, to embrace another woman who's, who served many gods rather than the true God, unequally yoked. That was just a beginning. Here he t- says that he loved many foreign women, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, the Hittites. They were all mosquito bites because they will harm him. These are the women. These, uh, well, verse 2, look at from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, not only for the kings, but the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Why? Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. God, God knows how to direct us. He knows how to counsel us. He, he, you know, he, knows, he, he knows us. And he says, and, and for Israel, he says, don't do that. It's, it has nothing to do with race. It has to do with their heart and who their heart is serving. And plus, these are the, these are the enemies, the Moabites, the Ammonites, all these. These were the enemies who they needed to clear out of Canaan when they came in, but they didn't do a full job, did they? He says, you shall not marry them. And why? Is because they're going to turn away your hearts after their gods. And it says Solomon clung to these in love. He clung to them. It was all outward. He lusted after them. And they just stole his heart. And he clung. What, what, why not? He has all the riches in the world, right? He's he's not in the right place with God. And now he's trying to fill. He's trying to fill his lust. He's trying to, you know, I have all the gold. That's one lust, okay? I've accumulated gold. I've accumulated horses. I have accumulated chariots. I'm in the business. I'm in the merchant business. I've got ships. I've got two armies, two navies now. They're going out. I've got apes. (laughs) I've got power. And now I can go out. And allow the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and my pride of life just to go hog wild. Because he says here he clung, clung to these in love. Solomon placed the lust of these women over the love that God had for him. See, God loves us, a deep love. As he showed on the cross. Yet, we see Solomon beginning, well, not beginning, but he is trying to serve two masters, isn't he? And what are we told about that? Can we serve two masters? No, you can't. Jesus said you'll be loyal to one and disloyal to the other. Well, guess who he's being disloyal to here? You can't serve two masters. One beautiful wife is enough, praise God. Two, three, four, no, man, it doesn't work that way. There's an old saying, you've heard it before. Some people uh, attribute this to, uh, to an American Indian, others to, an, uh, uh, to others, but we really don't know who coined this, but it says that inside of me there are two dogs. One of the dog, dogs is a mean and evil The other dog is good. The main dog fights the good dog all the time. And then when he was asked which dog wins, he reflected for a moment and replied, the one I feed the most. Guys, we we must battle through and, and, 
and, you know, feed the spirit. We need to feed our, our spirit. We need to feed our soul with the word of God, with, with the simple um, discipleship of, of prayer and reading the word of God and fellowship and, you know, iron sharpening iron and praying for one another, intercession. These are the things that we need to be feeding, the spiritual, not the lusts. We can't, we got to stop feeding our lusts. We got to stop feeding, because we'll get caught up in all kinds of things. And Solomon is falling into this same old trap Satan has set up since the beginning with Adam and Eve, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. And he's right in the middle. And we'll pick it up, mark your Bibles next week. But I will tell you <laughs> that uh, this guy is so caught up in this lust that he'll have a thousand wives. 700 wives and, and 300 concubines. I mean, he's just out of control, man. He's just totally out of control. But as we go to the Lord's table this morning or this evening... We want to, as Paul would say, you know, he tells us in Corinthians that we need to examine ourselves. And I don't know if any of this spoke to you. Maybe it, it maybe there's some conviction. Maybe you're struggling tonight and maybe not in the so-called lust of the flesh, but maybe a pride of life. Maybe it's, it's a lust of other things. Um, but whatever, whatever it is, Paul would clearly tell us, for us, for a man, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So right now, if there is something that the Spirit of God has been speaking to you, if there's something that you're struggling with tonight, just take it before the Lord within your heart at home. And, you know, God, God knows all the details, but he, he loves us when we call upon his name. He loves when we come there with open hands, uh, when we come before him with a, a broken heart and, and just say, God, you know, these are the things I'm struggling with or these are the things that I need of you, God. And, and he loves that. He loves when we examine our hearts and, uh, you know, we have a Savior and, and there's no closer friend than, than Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we know you hear our prayer. And you know our struggles, Lord. Nothing can be hidden from you. We confess it to you, God. We ask that you would help us, help us through this. We know that you will. For those of us maybe are hoarding, maybe we've, our bank accounts are very large and there's no way we're going to be able on this earth to, uh, to enjoy it, that you would give us that, 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 that courage to release the courage to give away, the courage to help, the wisdom, Lord, where to invest. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's time. Maybe we've hoarded time to ourselves and, and you want to use us, our hands, our feet. Maybe there's a gift that you've blessed us with, a talent that we're not using, Lord, for your glory. Whatever it is, God, we know you hear us and you love us. And you will help us and change us and forgive us and bless us. You went to the cross for that and these elements we have hold in our hands speak of that love. But the bread you said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And you ask us to remember you while we partake of it. So let's remember him. And then the cup, 
which is the new covenant. As you stated, it was in your blood, the covenant of grace and mercy and love. You asked us also to remember you of this as also, that this is the new covenant in your blood. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim and we will proclaim your death until you come, God. And that gives us hope. Let us partake. May the Lord bless you guys. And we're still here. If you need prayer, if you need just to talk, we're here throughout the week, you know. You need to come in and give us a call before. If not, you just pass him by command. We'd love to pray with you and, you know, just help you in any way we can. We miss you guys dearly. Oh, hang in there. This too will pass. Amen. God bless you guys.